Our text for this morning comes from Ezekiel chapter 37. Listen again to these words. Can these bones live? Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be ever pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord. Amen. In a vision, God brings Ezekiel to a barren valley. We can imagine this valley was desolate, sun beating down, bleaching whatever was on the ground. And as Ezekiel stood in this valley, he looked down, and then he looked to the horizon, and all he could see were bones, dry, sun-bleached bones. Probably looks something like this. This is an actual bone, by the way. Got it from the pet store. It's an animal bone. I think it was livestock once upon a time. Soon it's going to become a toy for my dog. But it's good for a sermon illustration. You know, as I look at this bone, I see traces of something that once lived. I look inside and I see the remnants of marrow. There was a time when in this bone there were blood vessels running through them. Those blood vessels would transport everything that the proteins in this bone needed to continually build and grow this bone to shape it, to reinforce it. But then those blood streams would also carry, uh, would carry away some calcium phosphate from this bone, carry to other parts of the body that needed that calcium. And so that allowed the bone even to give and not just receive. This bone was once living tissue. But now it's dry. And if you were to talk to anyone in modern science, anyone who understands biology and the anatomy of a skeleton, there is no human way on earth that a bone can live again. It just doesn't happen. So whenever Ezekiel was overlooking that barren sun bleached valley, Ezekiel was looking at these hopelessness. These bones shouldn't be living. And it didn't take modern science for Ezekiel to figure out that dry bones can't live. Verse 2 goes on to tell us that God would then take Ezekiel and walk him through this valley. I can imagine him just stepping out of the way so he doesn't crack anything and not tripping any bones over there. There were so many. And God did that to solidify an image of hopelessness in his mind, to bring about those feelings of sorrow and loss. And as Ezekiel began to accept that reality of hopelessness, God poses to him a question that seems absolutely ridiculous. It seems laughable because anyone beholding such a morbid sight shouldn't hear the question, can these bones live? But God asks him anyway, Ezekiel, can these bones live? Now, if you look at the original Hebrew text in this, uh, this passage, you'll find that the word in verse 10 to describe this whole mass of people is an exceedingly great force. But the English has translated it to army for our purposes. And with that in mind, we can imagine that God painted a vision of a battle for Ezekiel and for the reader. But since all these bones exclusively belong to the army of Israel, we can imagine this was a pretty crushing defeat. In fact, we can imagine that the battle's loss, the outcome was already predetermined. It was a hopeless battle for hopeless people. Dry bones. Can these bones live? That's when Martha wondered as she greeted Jesus with, Mixed emotions of sorrow and frustration. Lord, she said, if you had been here, my brother Lazarus wouldn't have died. She might as well have said, Jesus, if you could have done something about his illness, you could have stopped these bones from going dry. You could have won that battle over death for him. Can these bones live? 
Paul probably knew the story of Ezekiel 37, and he may have been thinking of that losing battle Israel faced in the valley when he wrote Romans 8. In that passage, he notes how the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. In other words, Paul points out that those who are born in the flesh, including himself, are hopeless, dry bones. He goes on in the, last, in the previous chapter, Romans 7, to show what that looks like in a daily life, that battle. He says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. So can these bones live? Maybe we've wondered that at times too, you know. It's not just Martha. It's not just Paul. Maybe that question was especially poignant as we felt that guilt of losing our battle again and again. We felt it as we again left the room to avoid that difficult conversation we don't want to have. We felt it as we again closed that incognito tab on our browser. We felt it as our mind raced to craft another excuse why the bank account was empty this month, just like it was last month. And in each of these losses, we share that struggle of Paul with his flesh. Yet we may also share that frustration of Mary, wondering why God has let this happen to me again. And from the perspective of Ezekiel, what we really saw it was restoration for our dry bones, that newness, thinking that somehow these sins that we turn to would restore our dry bones. But then we looked at them and all we found were, well, bones. And we cry out, oh Lord, can my bones live. As Ezekiel pondered God's question, he also pondered God's ability to make those words true. So Ezekiel answered his question in the best way he knew how. He said, oh Lord, you know. In his essence, he was saying, Lord, you are God and you can do the impossible. You can make these dry bones alive or leave them dead, but I'm just a servant waiting to see what you will do, because I don't know. You know. So the Lord told Ezekiel to speak his words over the bones that they would live. He said, behold, I, the Lord, will cause breath to enter these bones, and they shall live. God will cause breath to enter them. That word breath is so important because in the Hebrew language, that word for breath is the same word that Paul uses, walking by the Spirit. Breath and Spirit. So God is sending his Spirit to enter these bones. And by his Spirit, these dead, dry bones will live. And as Ezekiel prophesied, there was a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. And then sinews began to cover them, and there was skin, but there was still no spirit in them. So I think about those moments of defeat, those moments where we feel the weight of our guilt and realize that we too are dry bones. I think of us lying with those lifeless soldiers, because like them, I need the spirit. I need the word of God to give me hope and bring me life. And I need a promise, not of defeat, but of victory. Martha needed that promise too. She needed it as Jesus met her in the valley of Lazarus' bones, if you will. So Jesus gave her that promise. He said, your brother will rise again. I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day, she replied, not fully understanding what Jesus had to do with the resurrection. So Jesus made it clear. I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me shall never, though he die, yet shall he live. Some of you today might have walked in here feeling that defeat. You keep losing that fight losing that flight with your flesh and feeling as hopeless as a dry bone. 
You've confessed your sin at the beginning of worship, but you still feel like that dry bone and you're doubting your forgiveness. If you're doubting your forgiveness, then hear this. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the Spirit in you because it is that, and that Spirit is bringing you back to life. Here's why. The very fact that you are experiencing those feelings of guilt is the Holy Spirit at work in you. The very fact that you are feeling a need to repent is the Holy Spirit working in you. And that spirit is pointing you to the one who raised Lazarus and is also going to raise you too. You know, I think of that confession we speak every single week. And while I know there are those times where we speak it with that contrition, with that true brokenness, there are other times where it seems really rote. We say it week after week, and sometimes we say it because, well, everyone else is saying it. We speak the words, but we're not feeling a need to confess. We claim the guilt, but we're not feeling guilty. And this attitude can result from an apathy or blindness towards sinful habits, which we wrongly accept as right. For example, instead of speaking well of our neighbors and explaining everything in the kindest way, which is explanation to the Eighth Commandment, we instead say, Hey, can you believe what our president did this week? Can you believe he did that? Can you believe he would say such a ridiculous thing? Or maybe it's not that. Maybe it's someone you work with. Can you believe what they did yesterday? That was almost as bad as the day before. Can you believe that? Maybe it has nothing to do with Verbs. Maybe it's nothing to do with the words we say. Maybe it's an ad on TV that we're blind to or online. And that ad is portraying a person so as to incite lust in us. And then we think nothing of it because we're so used to it. And what we should be doing is getting angry at how this ad is teaching us to value that person, not for who they are, but for what they have. Apathy. And yet, because we are so immersed in it. We think it's okay. And in those moments, that is when we need God's spirit to reach into us and pull us up out of these dry bones. Can our dry bones live? Jesus was no stranger to that losing battle. He knew the fight with temptation. He knew how difficult it was. And he knew we cannot win it. Because when Jesus looked at the flesh, he knew it was flesh. When he looked at dry bones, he knew that they couldn't bring life by following them. He knew bones are bones. Instead, he walked by the Spirit. And that Spirit led him to take on the weight of everything that you and I make dry bones, all of our sin. And by walking that valley, that barren valley of bones for us, Jesus promised you that victory. He gives that to you. You see, when I spoke those words of forgiveness at the beginning of service, I was proclaiming that victory for you. I was proclaiming that promise of your resurrection, and you have every reason to believe that promise since you have a God who raised Jesus, who raised Lazarus, and will one day raise you. Can these bones live? They can, and they will. Even though Jesus proclaimed victory, we still face that daily battle of temptation. Paul continued to fight those battles throughout his life, but he learned that he cannot fight it by the flesh. Paul found that victory came through walking with the Spirit. In those moments, we find ourselves wanting to avoid that conversation. Walking with the Spirit is when we realize that we're called to humility. We're called to listen. We're called to love that person we don't want to talk to and maybe accept our need for grace. In those moments when we find ourselves hiding behind the darkness of a hidden sin or an incognito tab, walking with the Spirit beckons us out of that to bring it into the light and to seek forgiveness, maybe even accountability. And as we confront our desire to live beyond our means or to not steward our wealth very well, this is where the Spirit comes to us and points us to a contentment that only Jesus can give, not our bank account. Because the Spirit doesn't want us to go and stay as dry bones. 
We may not be raised until the last day, but we can at least experience some of that resurrection now. We can experience the joy that Jesus gives us. It's my encouragement to you that as we continue those daily battles, that we continually ask the Spirit to show us where we, to show us where bones are, to show us that a bone is a bone and it is not redeeming life. The Spirit will show us our sin, but He will also always point us to Jesus. Let us walk by the Spirit. Amen.